Hi, guys. So thanks, everyone, that's joined. Uh, my name is Andy Russell. I look after comms and marketing for Swano Research. Um, this is one of the one of the kind of first of a, a series of learning um, sessions that we wanted to do to to bring our supporters a little bit closer to the research that we're doing and allow them um, to meet some of the team, ask some questions, find out more about um, how the research is pro progressing. Um, we've got a, a great kind of list of speakers today. So we're going to hear from Harvey um, Sayota, who's the, the CEO of Spinal Research, research. Um, Dr. Jessica Kwok, who is also an associate professor, who is um, one of our uh, research scientists. Um, okay. And um, I'm going to do a little informal interview with one of our ambassadors um, who's kindly joined us today, Belle Young. So we'll have a, a little uh, talk about what it, it is like to live with a spinal cord injury and get that kind of personal um, slant on things. Um, and then at the end, I think Harvey's going to close up the session. So there's going to be plenty of times for Q&A, uh, 15 minutes at the end. So if anyone's got any questions, then um, feel free to ask them as well. And the other person on the call is Shauna, who is our heading up our fundraising team. So if there's any fundraising questions as well, then she'll be on hand to answer. So Harv, do you um, do you want to take over and yeah, drive? Sure. And I'll put myself I'm back on the mute. Screen. If you let me know if you can see it, Andy, then I do share. And um, we, can, we can get clacking, so I'm just going to go into slideshow mode. Is that OK, Andy? That's good for me. Yeah, that's good. Great. OK. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for attending. Appreciate that it's uh, probably a strange day and a, an exhausting week from the, the heat wave that we're experiencing. Um, so really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to come and join us. Um, my name is Harvey Sahota. Um, I joined as the Chief Executive of Spinal Research in August last year. Um, my background is um, working in finance and technology, um, but my association with spinal cord injury comes through my having an injury uh, 12 years ago, which has left me as a T12 paraplegic and a full-time wheelchair user. Um, I've, I've spent many years following the science very carefully and building um, really close um, relationships and, and friendships in some cases with some of the scientists who are doing some amazing things in this area. So when this role came along, um, I was re very honoured um, to have a go at it. And uh, here I am uh, almost a year later. So I'm going to give you a very quick, brief introduction to those that don't know much about spinal research. And forgive me if I, for those that do, um, I find going over old ground. Um, so um, spinal research's purpose, um, our sole purpose is, is to beat paralysis. Um, and specifically the paralysis that's caused by damage to the spinal cord. Um, so so that, that's our purpose. And our vision is very much that we believe in a future where Paralysis is no longer a life sentence. Um, our mission is to harness the power of international science to accelerate the delivery of revolutionary treatments, therapeutics, and technologies. And our values are, well, we challenge the status quo, we're results driven, we share the urgency that our community feels every day living with paralysis, and we bring hope. Um, our strategy is very, obviously with money being um, always a challenge, our strategy is only, only really about funding the best science. So um, we won't fund all science, we fund the best science, no matter where it is. We focus on chronic spinal cord injury specifically. Um, so those that are living with spinal cord injury today are likely to be the beneficiaries of our work in the long term. And we focus on expediency. So we want to make smart decisions so that we are able to deliver um, life-changing treatments uh, in the future. 
bit about the history. We turned 40 this year, believe it or not, um, which is an amazing story in itself. Um, we were the first um, charity to decide that it would be crazy enough to reverse paralysis 40 years ago. And back then, there was very little happening in the field. Um, only a handful of scientists had any, even half an interest in, in reversing spinal cord injury. Um, and so um, we've been there from the very start. Um, we have become international leaders. Um, so we, we run very important meetings, network meetings on an annual basis. We are typically at the table with most international collaborative efforts and initiatives um, and have had a voice on spinal cord injury for, for many decades. And along the way, we've funded some really important and historic breakthroughs. Um, and that's something that um, we are very proud of. And it's obviously a part of our journey to deliver those life-changing treatments to the spinal cord injury community. What do we do in terms of science? Well, we fund a range of types of projects. So basic science projects, um, preclinical and clinical projects. So we, we're quite diverse in our funding. Um, we do fund internationally. So it's not just in the UK. If the best science is in Japan or in the US or in China or in, um, in Canada, um, equally, if they've got the scientific rationale and justification, they are candidates for receiving awards from us. And we have a world-class scientific committee. Um, that's something we're very proud of um, and obviously keeps us um, aligned to best practices um, and most, most um, thought leaders, let's say, are involved in, in the way that we do our business. And this is just a graphical summary of what we've currently got in our research portfolio. So um, hopefully you can see there, we've got 16 projects that are underway at the moment, and half of them are, um, are clinical trials. So that means that humans are the beneficiaries of, of these experiments. Um, and 80% of them are focused on chronic spinal cord injury. So that's people that are injured and living with paralysis today. And as you can see, we've got different themes. Um, we've got some that are looking at very important functions like upper limb functions, so that's hands and arms and fingers. Um, we've got um, uh, themes whereby we're looking at pain and spasticity, and of course, also regeneration, plasticity. And finally, of course, one of the, the veins of, of, of spinal cord injury is issues with bowel, bladder and sexual function, which is something again that um, we've got a strong focus on. So that gives you a summary of our research portfolio. I'm gonna wrap up there because I think um, both Jessica and Bell will have far more interesting things to say than me um, and I'll pass you over. Thank you very much for your time. Andy, should I just um, start my presentation? I, I can do a quick introduction. Apologies, I, I was on mute. So yeah, um, Jessica, uh, Dr. Jessica Pock, by introduction. Um, yeah, if you can, that would be great. I think you can you share your screen. So let's see, should be loading now. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it, Jess. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. And do you see a block of pictures on the on the on the side? So anything blocking the screen at all in, in your screen? No, you're all good. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so good. Um nice to uh, to be able to actually um, give you a brief introduction of um, what uh, we are doing in the lab and also to introduce you the, the topics of spinal cord injury. So um, I'm Jessica Kwok, um, so I'm mainly working in um, the University of Leeds in the UK and um, at the same time I also have an affiliation in Ch uh, Czech Republic under the Czech uh, Academy of Science. Um, so what we are focusing on in the lab and um, you will actually see it at the end of uh, this presentation. So but what I would like to um, to, to tell you in the next um, 15, 20 minutes is mainly about um, what happens to spinal cord injury and, and what is the um, 
the, the cutting edge science that we are uh, working on right now uh, in general in the, in the community. So let's see. Okay, so who I am, uh, who am I, or I should say, um, so uh, I just give you a brief introduction of uh, where I come from. So I did my PhD actually in Hong Kong. Um, uh, and in, at the University of Hong Kong. So my main research area is uh, mainly looking at a, a glycan structure, or I, I also call it a, a, a sugar structure, um, called chondroitin sulfate. And you will again also hear about it uh, later as well. So I finished my PhD in Hong Kong looking at what is the function of sugar in, uh, in, our, in our body. And then I move on to um, the University of Cambridge um, uh, to do my postdoctoral study at the beginning, and then I uh, was promoted to senior research associate afterwards. Um, so at that time, I was looking at uh, how how does the sugar actually, or the carbohydrate actually affect uh, regeneration um, in the central nervous system? And I was, was particularly in, uh, interested in looking at the role of uh, carbohydrates under spinal cord injury, particularly um, uh, in the, uh, around the lesion site. And then um, in 2015, I moved to the University of Leeds um, as a lecturer, uh, start uh, setting up my group. So my group is uh, relatively new uh, in this area, but I've been working in spinal cord injury since 2005, as uh, you can see here. And recently, uh, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm also establishing a lab actually in the Czech Republic as well. Um, so these two um, institutions are running uh, concurrently to actually help us understanding um, the role of uh, uh, carbohydrates in uh, central nervous system. So uh, I understand that this is a population, a mixed population of audience. So uh, we do have people I think has a very good knowledge in the, in the central nervous system, but we also have people um, who might not as familiar with that. So I'll give you a very brief background of um, what is the normal function of spinal cord. Um, so I started here with um, what is in central nervous system. So you can see here um, the central nervous system I mainly uh, made up of the brain and the spinal cord itself. And anything that is coming or branching out from the central nervous system will constitute the peripheral nervous system here. And the, in, if you look at the main cell cellular basis, what are the main cells that is uh, 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 forming the central nervous system, um, neuron is one of the key population of the, of the cells. Uh, the, so the, here, what you're seeing uh, are two neurons actually connecting to each other, one in green and one in red. So one of the key process in, uh, in the central nervous system is to process information, both from the outside world, from the environment to our brain, to our perception, and also from our brain um, to the outside world as well. And in this case, what I'm talking about is the motor function. So it's a sensory function coming in and also motor fu function uh, going out. So the processing of the information will go from um, one end of the of the neurons, what we call dendrites, to, to the, um, uh, through the cell body, down the axon, and then there will be communication between two neurons and continue to propagate to the next neurons afterwards. And that is what the, um, the central key function of the, uh, of the nervous system. So there's an old myth, um, I think, in our society. What we learned in our secondary school is that um, damage in the central nervous system in general is permanent and that uh, our brain or our central nervous system does not regenerate. I think this has formed a central um, dogma in, in uh, scientific learning or in neuroscience for many years. But now, or I hope um, in the next few slides that I'm going to show you, you will realize that this is not the case. And therefore, um, there are so many scientists in the world actually working towards this area. Can we actually enhance re regeneration? Can we actually promote regeneration for the damage that has been impacted in the, in the central nervous system? So here is a slide telling you um, what happens um, after some, a spinal cord injury. So what you are seeing here on the left hand side is, the, is a schematic diagram of our spinal cord. So we have the nerve signals going down or up the, uh, the, the central nervous system and then they will go out um, to the peripheral um, nervous system and also control our muscle contraction. In a normal circumstances, um, it is, I, I normally use this example, so it is almost like a very good, very efficient um, highway or motorway. So the signals will come uh, from the outside going 
up the brain. You also have the uh, signals coming from the brain asking your motor, uh, your, your muscles to actually execute a particular function. So it's really, when it is working well, it is like a good um, um, motorway system. However, when we have a spinal cord injury, and um, what happened is that there's a disruption in the highway. So uh, this, the pictures that I'm showing here, of course, are uh, really drastic uh, accidents. But on the other hand, there are lots of different accidents that can have happened um, in the highway. And it's very similar to what happened in the spinal, after spinal cord injury. So you will have a lesion in the spinal cord, and this disconnect the communication from the brain to your muscle or the other way around from the environment back to the brain. And that is the, the problem. So the processing of signals and information is lost due to the injury. So um, how about the, the reactions from, the, from our body um, uh, to the spinal cord injuries? What would happen afterwards? Um, so the initial, in the initial phase, what you will have is something what we call a spinal shock. So um, there are uh, different uh, responses from your, from your body actually um, reacting to the initial insult. So think about um, when you, well, probably I think uh, we haven't had a uh, fall for a long time. So, but if you trip on the road or you have a bike accident, you might re remember that the initial minutes or initial 30 seconds or so, you basically do not have any memory of what has happened or you will have lost the muscle power, you cannot actually get up yourself. So, so this is actually very similar to what it's experiencing in the spinal cord. So the spinal cord have the shock uh, or sustain the shock, and therefore they will have a dysregulation of their normal function. Um, this will last for uh, from days to months, um, and the phenomenon that uh, will come out from this spinal shock, including, uh, it includes um, hypertension, for example, so you will have increase in blood pressure, you will have hypothermia, so so um, you have a dysregulation in the body temperature. You will also lose the reflexes um, uh, in your body as well. And in here, um, I'm not just talking about the normal muscle reflex, but also the regulation of uh, the normal function in our body. And as I said, this lasts um, from days to months, depends on the situation. And then afterwards, then you will move into <clears throat> it's an acute or chronic stage, um, as what um, we, we call here. So if you look at, um, at the spinal cord after lesion, so what happened after the lesion is that there will be a lot of cellular reaction um, takes place, trying to confine the lesion area to reduce the damage uh, in order to preserve the function. So the first cells that will come into the environment is the, uh, are the immune cells. So they will move to the environment because there's a, a danger signal basically released from the cells um, after injury. So they move to the area trying to basically equip the area for fighting the uh, exogenous uh, infection, bacteria, for example, um, or, or some other um, insults. So, and when the immune, immune cells comes into the area, they will release some molecules to attract more cells to come into the area. And in this case, um, they, what they will attract is something what we call uh, glial cells. So glial cells is specific cell types in the central nervous system. And we also call them nursery cells as well, because they are basically doing everything um, in, in the central nervous system. They will be feeding the neurons with nutrients. They will be doing all the cleaning, removing all the metabolites uh, from, from our normal physiological response. Um, so it is very similar to like the parents cleaning up the houses for the kids, basically. Um, so that is what the glial cells are doing. So they will come into this, the area, try to clean up the area, and at the same time, try to protect the surrounding area from further damage. So. So the glial cells come into here, but there's one particular um, type of uh, glial cells, uh, which call astrocytes. They will, in response to the immune, uh, the immune cell signal and also the initial insults, they come into the environment, but at the same time, they actually trigger their endogenous um, uh, intrinsic proliferation uh, response, and they will multiply significantly in their number and try to seal off the lesion area. And, in a way, they are actually forming a scar around the lesion sites uh, to protect the area. In the initial phase, this is a very good response because it is, as I said, it is um, preventing further damage. But in the long run, uh, this scar around the lesion area actually performs or uh, executes a, 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 a 
how to exert a, a detrimental effect actually to regeneration and afterwards, which I'll tell you later. So the asteroids that are coming into the area uh, will also release um, uh, certain materials, certain proteins, and also signals, signaling molecules as well. Um, again, try to seal off the area. So that's basically what happened after spinal cord injury um, in the subacute stage. So, and then eventually what happened is that there will be a cyst formed in the, in the spinal cord. So um, because of all these phenomena that I've just mentioned, um, there will be a limitation in the new cell production. Uh, I process what we call neurogenesis. Uh, that's uh, because of the release of molecules by the glial cells, it will also make the environments very inhospitable uh, for um, new growth. And that is, uh, these are the two main uh, issues uh, related to regeneration of, um, uh, of function, or recovery of function uh, after spinal cord injury. So, um, so and, and, and obviously, I think we all know about that in the chronic stage um, after spinal cord injury, we will have the loss of function as we all know about. So um, I do understand again that uh, in our audience, a lot of you are actually training for um, a long runners. Um, so um, I was thinking of how to actually correlate this information to, um, to a running um, individual. So if you look at, um, the, at the running process itself, so in order to be able to run for a long distance, so most of the people will be uh, concentrating on the limb movement. So you need to have a proper style of running, for example, to, to make it efficient. Um, you will also need to control your uh, rhythm of breathing in order to sustain a long distance running as well. You need to have very good mind, a strong mind to go through the long distance, to go um, to overcome the fatigue, for example. And But at the same time, there's also a lot of regulation in our body. Uh, for example, the temperature regulation Regulation, bed, uh, kidney, and bladder control in order to allow you to run for a long distance without going to the washroom, wash for example. Uh, and then you also need to control your heart, heart speed and also um, the hydration and the nutrients level in order to allow you to run for a long distance. So, but after spinal cord injury, uh, all these steps, all this control that I've just mentioned will be, um, will be dysregulated, will be will have problems. So obviously, depends on the level of injury, um, there will be a significant proportion of patients uh, who will have uh, respiratory problems. So they will have problems in controlling their diaphragm movements, for example, and therefore they cannot regulate their, their breathing as easily. Um, Paralysis is something that we all know about after spinal cord injury. This is one of the common features, so loss of um, the control of motor function. And at the same time, you will also, we also have problems in uh, controlling the autonomic functions that I've just mentioned here in pink as well. And, and also, um, not just all these motor functions that we are talking about, um, uh, patients from spinal cord injury will also have problems uh, with mental health issues as well. So um, this is basically to illustrate to you a, a, a apparently simple injury in the central nervous system can actually trigger a really significant impact to our body. So, um, so what did, how about the research? So what are the research uh, or scientists actually have been doing in the last uh, 40 years, like what Harvey has just mentioned? Um, so there are a few, um, uh, traditional conserved um, treatments or treatment strategies uh, people have been looking at. Uh, one, of course, um, as maybe I think a lot of people will be familiar with is rehabilitation. So it's basically going through different types of exercise, different types of training paradigm, occupational health, uh, physiotherapy, different types of combination of um, training in order to maintain the muscle tone, maintain the health, general health status of the patients. And in some circumstances, um, these exercise will also help in the recovery of muscle, mu muscle function. Um, in the last, um, I would say 10, 20 years, um, there's also a, a very strong field of uh, neuromodulation in, uh, for spinal cord injury. So um, what's happened here is um, there will be uh, the patients will have an implantation of electrodes directly connecting to the central nervous system. So there are different types of modulation then uh, can be done. Uh, one is to, um, to have the modulation to amplify the signals that is uh, coming out from the uh, uh, severed or injured uh, nerve system and, and then also feed it back to the, to the muscle afterwards. So you basically amplify something that you go through your mind 
amplified it using an external computer, for example, and then feed it back to the, to the motor system, to allowing you to control your muscle movements. So that is one type of neuromodulation. Uh, more recently, I think there's also um, uh, uh, studies uh, or clinical trials uh, with uh, neuromodulation using epidur epidural stimulation. So what happened in epidural stimulation is basically implanting the electro in the spinal cord, uh, administering really low level of electricity or, elect uh, or electrical signals to the spinal cord. It's, the signal itself is not sufficient to drive muscle function. But on the other hand, when it combined to a very strong um, uh, uh, paradigm of rehabilitation. A lot of the patients, um, quite a number of patients, actually can uh, elicit a muscle function afterwards. And what happened to the epidural stimulation in that case is um, basically lowering the threshold for a muscle response. So imagining that you are in a swimming pool and you need to lift up a 50 kilogram person in the swimming pool, it's a lot easier to do that then you need to lift another person, a 50 kilo person, 50 kilogram person up in the, in the air. And the main, reason the main reason for that is because there's buoyancy in the water. It lowers, it lessens the, the weight of the person and therefore it is easier to lift the, the person up in water. And the epidural stimulation, in a way, it is acting something like that. It is lowering the, the threshold in order to trigger a muscle response. And so a combination of rehabilitation exercise and neural modulation has been quite successful in um, uh, recovering function after spinal cord injury. The other um, uh, key research topics in the area is uh, the use of stem cells. And there are two different types of scenario here. One is with the use of the endogenous stem cells. In the spinal cord, um, there's a um, hypothesis that the endogenous stem, there's an endogenous stem cell pool in the central canal of the spinal cord. So it's basically right in the middle of the spinal cord. Um, there are studies showing that these pool of cells in the, in the central canal, uh, they can proliferate, uh, they have the capacity to proliferate so, um, and, and differentiate into different types of cells. And there's also evidence showing that with the use of um, some pharmaceutical um, modulation, we can also increase the number of cells, uh, cell proliferation in this stem cell pool, therefore increasing the possibility of uh, these cells to, to uh, develop into um, neurons, for example, or glial cells to replace the lost cells um, after spinal cord injury. So that is one um, research area that um, scientists are working on right now. And the other one is transplantation of um, stem cells. So in this case, um, the cells are being uh, taken out from different areas. So for example, in the brain, there's also a pool of stem cell in the brain, which can be used to derive into um, different uh, 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 neural stem cells. And then um, there are also other cells which we can re-derive from the skin of your, of your body. Um, so, and this is a pool uh, of cells that which we can induced into a pluripotent stem cells. And under um, a defined uh, growth condition, so we can actually drive the differentiation of these cells to replace uh, the lost cell in the central nervous system. And therefore, um, there's a potential of these newly generated cells or newly differentiated cells uh, in uh, performing the lost function. So these are the um, uh, area related to stem cell. And finally, I'm going to tell you about my research topics here. And this is the work that is um, supported by the spinal research. So um, this is the, the last um, key research area that, um, that is actively having a research on. So it's about uh, re regeneration and neuroplasticity. So I'm using this diagram again uh, in, as a spinal cord uh, injury uh, model. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, so after injury, there will be a, a, a lot of inhibitory molecules or molecules released by the astrocytes, initially trying to seal off the lesion area to protect the surrounding tissue. But over time, um, these molecules accumulated in the area are proven to be more inhibitory to the nerve regeneration. So they are there to prevent other cells from coming in, but at the same time, they're preventing regeneration of um, neurons going through the lesion area. And there are lots of research actually in the last 20 years looking at can we remove the inhibitory molecule in the area 
with the hope that we can promote regeneration. So let me first give you an introduction, very quick introduction of what are these inhibitory molecules. One of them uh, is belonging to the family of myelin associated molecules, um, so such as noble OM, uh, OMGP, and also the myelin associated molecules as well. The other one is uh, the chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan. This uh, is basically taking you back to my research area because chondroitin sulfate is a carbohydrate molecule, it's a sugar. Um, it is also very commonly found in the cartilage as well. But after spinal cord injury, there's a, a drastic upregulation of chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan in the area. And these two groups of molecules are very inhibitory to regeneration of the, of the uh, neurons. So in a way, I think um, these molecules are almost similar to the debris that you normally see in a construction site. Um, so in order to remove that, what we need to do is, in, in order to encourage regeneration, what we need to do is actually removing these uh, deposited molecules in the, in the lesion area. So um, can we do that? The answer is yes. Um, so there are... Uh, uh, antibodies, for example, targeting the myelin-associated molecules now. There's also an a enzyme which can uh, re uh, uh, remove the chondroitin sulfate in the lesion area and removing the, uh, the inhibitory mon molecules in their area. So what happened then is uh, the, the debris or the inhibitory molecules are being removed by the new pharma, potential pharmaceuticals, uh, enhancing regeneration across the lesion sites. It also um, encouraged sprouting. This is a process we call uh, in, the, in, uh, in terms of regeneration. Um, sprouting is basically, uh, uh, it generally means rewiring in the central nervous system. So allowing a detour of the, uh, of the connections to take place. So we'll have new connections, which normally doesn't occur, but because of the, the use of the pharmaceutical, um, uh, potential some pharmaceutical agents, then we are allowed to make new connection, providing a new alternative pathway to connect to um, the muscles for function. And these are basically the two events, regeneration and neuroplasticity that we have been focusing on uh, in the field of spinal cord research. So, I hope I was able to um, give you a very, very brief summary of what uh, uh, the, the research uh, has have been focusing on in the last um, 20 years. Um, so exercise and rehabilitation, rehabilitation still uh, uh, being a key research topic. So how can we do it better? Uh, neuromodulation is another one. The use of stem cell and also encouraging regeneration and plasticity using pharmacological tools um, are the other research areas. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me with this email address, and I'm also happy to take your questions as well. Thank you. Jessica, thank you so much. And uh, um, conscious that we, we, we do want to make some time for questions. So hopefully um, everyone can, can hang on the line a little bit if we overrun and apologies for that um, in advance. Um, so next, um, we're going to have a, a quick conversation between uh, myself and our ambassador, Bell Young. Um, both Bell and I had a spinal cord injury um, and uh, of differing levels. So actually kind of um, exemplifying the, the good examples that um, Jessica pulled out in terms of the, the different, co different complications that can happen from different levels of injury. Um, but we're just going to walk through a couple of, of questions with you, if you don't mind. And I thought just starting off with, you know, can you give us a quick um, introduce introduction to yourself so everyone can know who you are. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Belle. Um, I'm 19 and was injured when I was eight. Um, my injury was at C2, so I've been paralyzed from the neck down. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I had, you know, there's ups and downs with having a spinal cord injury, but I'm living a happy um, life, yeah. Yeah, I think you you, you definitely uh, do a lot more than most people, it seems to be. You tell me all your little adventures. Um, so we're going to kind of talk through a, a couple of different different questions so the, the guys can learn a little bit more. And conscious that some of these are quite personal questions, so um, you know, we've agreed to, to, you're happy to kind of share that. So can you just tell us a little bit what life was like prior to your injury, um, just very, kind of briefly? 
Yeah, so um, I was born in Skipton in North Yorkshire. Um, I lived with my uh, mum and dad and brother. Um, I just a very normal life, really. Went to school. Um, I was quite a sporty child, loved being outside and um, playing with my brother. Um, really enjoyed school and being my friends. Um, and yeah, I mean, I um, my, had my injury um, falling, off spine, uh, falling off a climbing frame, so it was always sort of tumbling about, really. So, yeah, that's the, the, the devastating thing about these injuries is that it happens to every day, things that you do every day. And I think as a child, obviously, you know, being on the climbing frame is a very normal and natural thing for you to do. Are, are you able to talk through a little bit about kind of what happened on that day? I know it's very difficult to remember, but just to just to give us a sense of how how that transpired. Yeah, um, so I had my injury after school, sort of late um, afternoon. I was in my neighbour's back garden and we were just playing on a climbing frame like any eight-year-old children do. Um, and unfortunately, I just fell and freak accident um, fell onto my neck um, and um which was fine for a C2, like I said. Um, I mean, I don't remember much of it. I remember the paramedics arriving and sort of um, making sure that I was staying awake. Um, and from then, the next thing I remember is waking up in the hospital. Yeah. Um, just sort of moving on to that, I guess, you know, you must have spent, like the rest of us, for quite a significant time in hospital with their kind of highs and lows to that. and. Yeah, I mean, I spent nine months in hospital. There were some lows, but weirdly, I remember a lot more highs. I think I am very thankful that I was so young when I had my accident. Sort of made me a bit naive and have forgotten the lows, I think, that my parents may remember. Um, but I mean, I was surrounded by really nice people. I. The nurses and the doctors were amazing people, really kind. And yeah, I mean, I there was intense physio and physio every day. I had a bit of schooling in hospital, but mainly just surrounded by supportive people. Great, great. Um, so I, I guess if you can just talk about a couple of the complications that you experience in sort of everyday life. I know Jessica did a good job of talking about the theory, but I guess we live the practice, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for me, a lot of, I mean, it, I mean, it affects my life every day in massive ways, but it's simple things like um, brushing my hair and getting dressed that is just not possible without um, someone else. So I have 24 hour care. Um, and I mean, I get on really well with all my carers, but they definitely help me in every aspect of my life. And, and talking about your life, um, you know, you've done a huge amount since you since hospital. Um, and can you tell us sort of what, what you've done since and then you know, what you're doing now, what your plans are for the, for the future? Yeah, so um, when I came out of hospital, I then went back into school, um, finished primary school and um, did secondary school, got my GCSEs and A-levels, which was definitely a challenge at times. Um, and then I am now at uni studying psychology, which I'm really enjoying. I'm studying psychology. Um, and I mean, I love traveling. Me and my family get away as much as we can. Um, but yeah, I mean, just try to keep busy, really. I think you're... Uh... You're doing exceptionally well, and you know, going going through schooling, getting to where the A levels that you have, and and now at university. Hopefully, COVID hasn't disrupted your the enjoyment of university too much, and, and you've got another couple of years left. So, um, there's just one more question, really. So, I guess, why do you support Swana Research yourself? And then, do you have a message because for the fundraisers that we've got on the line and the supporters out there? Yeah, I mean, I, I support spinal research because it gives me a sense of hope and 
knowing that the future could be brighter. I think it does that for everyone with a spinal cord injury. Um, and without the fundraising, there is no research. So it's so important that people, if they can, give their money and fund the research that can change so many people, so many people's lives yeah. for the better, 100%. Yeah, that's definitely what I take from what Jessica was talking right now is that there is hope out there and there's theory that can be delivered upon, but we just need a little bit more support to get it across the line. Um, thank you so much, Bro. I really appreciate, you know, collectively um, your time um, uh, and, and sharing those those messages. Um, Harvey, it might be a good time to to port over to you, if that's OK, if you make sure you're off mute. And uh, yeah. Bell, I'll put you back on mute, if you don't mind, just in case. Is that all right? Okay. Oh. Thank you, Belle. Thank you for that. Um, I will share my screen again. Um, let's hope that you can see that. Andy? We good? Yeah. Okay, so... Um, this section, I really wanted to just summarize where we're at as a charity at the moment. Um, and um, I think most of you can probably imagine that for medical charities who are like Spinal Research, and there are others, of course, we're not the only medical charity, um, that we're, vi we're a vital cog in an ecosystem, a research ecosystem to be able to develop treatments and cures for patient communities, for communities, like spinal cord injury. Um, the significant portion of our income, um, more than half, is associated to events. And you can probably imagine that the pandemic has absolutely decimated that income. We've been without events now for closing in on 16 months. So it's been very, very difficult um, for us. And that means, um, that, um, well, I should add that the, the government didn't offer any support, so the UK government didn't offer any support to medical research charities. Some frontline charities that, so, that provide frontline services did get some government support, but so far, and um, frustratingly, um, the UK government hasn't offered any support during this period for medical research charities, like Spinal Research. So what does that mean? It means that we don't have funds to fund new research and, and extend our pipeline. Um, it also means that um, if this continues, it means that our existing portfolio will also be a threat, which is not something we, we've ever had to face in our history um, as a charity. And what that means is obviously translates into, as Bell was saying, uh, uh, you know, a loss of hope for, for the 60,000 people in the UK and the millions living worldwide with um, spinal cord injury. So um, I don't want to beat around the bush and we appreciate that it's been a difficult time for everyone in the world during this time. Uh, and um, that should not be underestimated or understated. Um, but what we're asking for is now, if you are able to get involved um, and support us so that we're able to secure our current portfolio and begin to, to invest in the next stages of our pipeline. Um, so our events team, Shauna is obviously on the line, is on standby to help everybody prepare to coordinate and make the best of any participation that you choose to make. Um, you know, help us keep the hope alive um, to beat paralysis. And, you know, of course, as always, thank you for your support in advance. Um, we know that it's not the most easy time to participate in, in events. And, and also um, there's obviously a lot of things happening in the world, um, the knock-on effect to, to people's livelihoods um, and, and, um, and careers that um, of course, will play a part in people's ability to, to help. But if you are able to, it will be hugely appreciated and um, more so now than ever. I really just wanted to end there without being too gloomy, um, but it was important that we were able to deliver that, deliver that message to our supporters. Great stuff. Thank, thanks, Harvey. 
So guys, we've got, um, you know, sort of 10 minutes and hopefully we can uh, run over a little bit and apologies that if that happens, you know, to open up the questions and see, um, you know, whether anything that we've spoken about needs more clarification. I think just Jessica did a great job of uh, simplifying the science, but I'm sure there's probably a few questions in there as well. Um, everyone is on mute right now, so uh, I don't know whether James, for example, whether you might have a, a question you wanted to ask. Um, Jessica, I just want to say that uh, I thought that was a really nice summary of the current state of the field. I think I met you at either neuroscience or Asilomar going over your perineural network, which I think is super, super interesting. And sometime I'd like to talk to you about that uh, balloon method that you've developed for doing spinal cord injuries. We've been wanting to do that for quite a long time. And that sounds like a, a, a interesting technology that I'd like to know more about, but really nice job summarizing it. So I'm glad you recorded it. I thought you, everyone will find it very, very accessible. Nice job. Great stuff. Thank you very um, much, James. Um, maybe we can actually um, uh, design another time to have another meeting to talk about your interest in the balloon in a surgery, if we would like to. Yes. Sure. That'd be great. Uh, we may yeah. be reaching out to you. Yes, that would be good. So I, I, I'm conscious that we're recording it. So there was kind of maybe a couple of questions that I could throw out that might be um, good for you know the recording for people that perhaps aren't on this call. Um, I think I think Jessica's done a really great job of kind of talking about the progress we've made for the last 20 years. And I guess one question that comes up is around perhaps what's the best hope for progress now? What's the best hope, um, you, you know, because of technology wise or therapeutic wise? And I just wonder maybe whether Harvey, you might be able to kind of summarize that a little bit of um, how-, how you I, I mean, if we give a very high lay person summary in the um, right now, what is hot and what we're hopeful about is, of course, neuromodulation, as, um, as, as Jessica touched upon earlier. These are um, device-based technologies that um, are showing a lot of promise to be able to um, either improve existing function or to uncover um, some function that perhaps we didn't know um, we might have, might have seen. Um, and so these types of things are in clinical trial now, and, and that's quite exciting, tantalizing and close. Um, in addition to that, there's some great work going on and, and has been going on for some time with regards to looking at and understanding the chronic uh, spinal cord lesion. And that's obviously, you know, the bulk of what Jessica's work is doing. There's a number of groups that are working in this space. So I think there are, there are a number of therapeutics in the pipeline on that front, which is going to offer hope for, for spinal cord injury, especially chronic spinal cord injury, which is proven historically stubborn to respond to therapies. So we're excited on that front. I think those are probably the two kind of exciting areas. Um, but of course, you know, the, the advent of um, all of the genomics and, and all of the epigenetic work that's going on is going to prove really interesting for even more robust recovery in the future. So that's my very simple summary of where we're at. You used, the, you used a couple of um, long scientific words there. Do you want to just kind of maybe explain that from a lay perspective, those two? Yeah, sorry. So neuromodulation, obviously, we talked about, which is the electrical stimulation yeah. of, 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 um, of the spinal cord in this case. Um, and this is obviously going to be through the use of devices, where we're talking about providing some kind of therapies that would um, make the spinal cord where it's been injured more permissive to, um, to either um, rewire or to regenerate. I think there are therapeutics that are in the pipeline that are quite exciting on that front. In terms of longer term, in, you know, are we going to get up and dance and play the piano? Um, that is something that I think is um, kind of almost the next phases of, of discovery a bit further down in the pipeline. Um, which I think is also quite exciting in terms of all of the technologies related to gene therapies and things like that. So um, that's kind of my very simple, you know, 10, 30,000 foot view of, uh, of spinal cord injury, if that helps. And I guess one thing I've learned since joining, I think, is that, forgive me if I'm wrong in saying this, but it's around 
there's no magic bullet in terms of the one route to treatment. It's it's a, around a collective or a cumulative um, treatment. Is that that's correct, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think combination yeah. combination yeah. therapies. Yes, I mean that is actually something that I would like to expand on as well, because I think I think Javi has been giving a really good overview. I wouldn't say that is a layman's perspective. I think actually it has provided a very good insight into what the the future direction will be. So um, I think the challenge of um, in this field is that uh, spinal cord injury is not just one single. It's not a single disease. So it is a single injury which actually cause a lot of problems in different systems in the whole body. Um, as I use the, the running individual as an example, but each of the points that I, I provided there is an individual biological topic. And so, and then each of the treatments or research area that I mentioned, they all have these different potential um, tools already in clinical trial, but we have no clue of how would they work actually when they are working in combination. Are we going to have a ad additive effect? Are we going to have an adverse effect? What is going to happen to the patient is something that we do not know. We still have a long mile to go in order to combine them to have a holistic points, uh, holistic treatment. But individually, I think we, we are very close to, to have some tools which we can use soon, I think. Right. And I think one, one thing that, I think what the the development of the vaccination program, for example, has done, it shortens that, that mile, right? So, you know, with the proper funding and with collective um, teams working together all around the world and, and bringing everything together, we can shorten those time frames down. And that kind of leads to what Harvey was saying about, you know, unfortunately, a lot of this falls down to money and um, having that, that, that financial backing to, to really make it push forward. Oh, was there anything you want to you going to add to that? No, I think Jessica made sum that up really well. I think um, you know the, um, the the you know the science is really exciting. I think it's in an exciting stage. Um, you know, clinical trials are underway, but as Jessica said, you know, there's there's a lot of work to do because you know a spinal cord injury is quite complex, and um, there are many opportunities. And you know, obviously, Bell has you know has demonstrated. You know, a particular area um, that, that might make her life different, you know, more in, more, let's say, easy to live, I would say. I, you know, I don't want to diminish the, the quality of life that she's living right now, but I'm sure if she was able to do something 10 minutes quicker or, um, you know, your, your morning was, was, was half an hour shorter in terms of your preparation, I think you'd be pleased for that time back, I suspect. Um, I think that's probably fair to say. So quality of life is really important, you know, and that could be simply through something as simple as, um, you know, pinch process um, or, a, or a grasp. Um, or it could be, of course, for example, being able to breathe or to breathe better. And that's, I think, when we spoke previously, Jessica, you, you mentioned the breathing side of things, that there has been some theoretic, theoretical hope there and provable, you know, hope. And, you know, even that restoring that kind of function, improving that function will be life-changing for, for a lot of people um, out there. Um, so that's, that, that's great. I'm conscious of kind of time. I've got one more question. My apologies, uh, Shauna, I'm gonna to come to you and I didn't prep you for this, but we've got fundraisers on the line and we've got, um, We've got to record this and this is going to be seen by a lot of fundraisers so it's you know in terms of driving that fundraising further how can we find out more is there could you just kind of articulate the best ways to get in touch with you and the ways that the supporters can really maximize their their um their involvement i guess so i think um one of the big the one big thing about covid it's kind of put a pause on everything isn't it everything's kind of you know been delayed and things like that so I think one big thing at the moment is kind of people being brave enough to kick start their fundraising again to kind of start sharing it and be brave enough to say that these events are going ahead um because I think that's where we're at now we've got an event coming up next weekend and the London landmarks and and that's going to be the start kind of the waterfall of the challenge events to come so I think it's just about sharing it, telling people what you're doing, showing them your training process, the amount of work that goes in for you to preparing for these events is quite huge. 
um, I think it, it's being brave enough to ask because it has been such a difficult year. Um, but it is, you know, it, that's part of you're doing the challenge and half of it is the running and the preparing for that. And the other half is the fundraising. So, you know, with such a monumental kind of ch challenge or undertaking, it's worth putting in the doing the asks and, you know, making such a huge difference to this charity, which is more vital now more than ever and um, with the year we've just had. Um, and, you know, any kind of little events that you want to start thinking about having like outside barbecues or picnics or coffee mornings at work or things like that that you're thinking about again. If you've never had an event before like that's where we're here to help so don't hesitate to get in touch and we can kind of talk you through it um little steps and help you kind of think how big or small you want to go um but don't panic if there's anything you're not sure about just please get on the line to me or hannah you've got we've sent you lots of emails so um and i'll be sending you this recording so <laughs> you'll have it again but yeah don't hesitate to get in touch because we're here to talk right. through anything Nothing i think too big, too big or small that's it. It's on your own in a group. You know, it doesn't have to be running around the block or doing the physical challenges. There's a bunch of ways to, to really help us, isn't there? So cool. OK, well, we're just over time a little bit. Um, hopefully I haven't we haven't eaten into people's evenings. It last call really for the questions. I know that um, just wanted to throw it out there in case there's a burning question that no one's asked yet. Um, and if not, we can we can finish up and we can circulate a recording later. Okay. Brilliant. Cool. Thank you so much. Like last thing is to say thanks, guys, for all the time that you know you've given Jesper especially and um, and Bell. Amazing, you know, that we've been able to get an hour of your time. So thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Cheers, evening. Guys. Thanks everyone thank for attending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, Thanks. yes, bye-bye. Bye, Sue. -bye. Bye. Bye.